Larry, one thing I picked up, which was very strange, uh, and in my brain works a little bit differently from most people's, but I think you'll be perhaps right on the similar wavelength. There was a complaint in there from Devlin Barrett from the Washington Post who was bitching to the special counsel's office, and he's saying, hey, I called you guys yesterday for a quote on my story. I debriefed you on what I was working on, and I was we were, we were at the Washington Post was holding the story, awaiting some type of a comment or no comment from you. And here I find out that the same story ends up in a competitor's newspaper less than you know x amount of hours later before the special counsel got back to him. So here's a guy who who, who had a scoop, and he got scooped. So I'm thinking, wait a second, you're talking about leaking to the media. This is a little bit more sinister if this is set up as an intel operation where if I have, if I'm working for XYZ newspaper and I contact these guys and say, hey, I got this, got some stuff I want to comment on it, or what are they doing with the information? Are they setting up shop on the people that are, um, might be able to, to take Mueller out? Are they setting up shop and making that individual or that publication a target? Or are they contacting their friends at the New York Times and saying, hey, the right. Washington Post is breaking a story that says, that says this, you better get on it. I mean, it, it, there's all, it seems like there's, a, there's all kind of strange things going on. Now, I asked, I, I asked the special counsel, I asked Peter Carr about that today, and he said, I don't, I said, what's going on? Barrett said you poached the stories and you sold them out to a competitor. What, what do you have to say about that? And Barrett covered that both in an email and a text where you're saying, hey, what am I telling you this stuff for if you're going to steal my stories? Basically, I am paraphrasing, but it's basically exactly says that. And Carr didn't say that. He said, I, I don't have any, I have no comment, which, of course, is what he was going to say. <laughs> he said all, all the time. But it raises serious questions. Like, not even the mainstream media is immune from the leaks these guys are leaking to a select clientele yeah uh, and they're and ratting out ratting out their colleagues yeah i mean that, that's that's pretty much par for the course in the swamp of washington dc right where people are close to other people where you know they go out and socialize with each other and scratch each other's backs and, and do favors there's another aspect of these emails which is extremely interesting and more than troubling as i'm sure everybody knows because i've talked about it on crowdsource the truth many times and elsewhere uh, on freedomwatchusa.org, on wnd.com, on Newsmax, is that I had a whistleblower, he prefers that I not use his name right now, he's not in good health, who I took to the FBI, James Comey, through a federal judge, Royce Lambert, and I got him immunity with a lawyer called Deborah Curtis, who was working in the U.S. Attorney's Office, and the two special agents assigned to this investigation, which was dealing with mass surveillance by James Clapper, John Brennan, CIA, the NSA, the FBI, uh, were William, G William Barnett and uh, another individual by the name of Giardina. And these persons, including Curtis, were assigned to the Office of Special Counsel in the investigations of Russian collusion and obstruction of justice. This was Comey's inner circle. These are his henchmen, all three of them. So it goes on top of everything we know about Bruce Orr, the Justice Department, Peter Strzok, Lisa Page. And there was even a text message that came out some months ago from Peter Strzok calling this investigation, excuse the French, bullshit. Uh, and it's not bullshit because the client had the goods on all of these intelligence agencies, Comey, Clapper, Brennan. Uh, they surveilled Supreme Court justices, including the Chief Justice, 156 judges. Donald Trump, yours truly, anybody who was challenging or critical of the government, and this was buried. And now these people are working on the Mueller investigation, and we can see just in this particular instance what's been buried with regard to Freedom Watch and communications with the media. So no surprise here. But, you know, everything that goes around comes around, and what's coming around looks very sinister. Now, guys, I'm showing this uh, schedule here that gives us some information about who contacted, them, who contacted them and when, 
what uh, media outlet they're associated with and what the response was. It looks like you know, more than 90% of the responses were declined comment. But why is this column that says research redacted? Larry, you've told me, oh, sorry, no, Kevin Shipp has told me many times that it's illegal for the FBI, the DOJ, the CIA to redact items that aren't classified. So what are we looking at here with these redactions? Well, I wouldn't use the word illegal, Jason, but there are exemptions in FOIA. Okay, which can deal with internal deliberations. Ah. And, yeah, can deal with investigatory exemptions or privilege. And they're always overused. Uh, they hope that the, just, that the judge will not require in-camera production. They set forth affidavits to try to say that these things are exempt, and they hope that the judges will rubber stamp it. And most of them over at the federal court in Washington, D.C., 90% of which are still Clinton and Obama appointees will simply rubber stamp whatever the Justice Department is telling them. But not this judge, Emmett Sullivan. He was first appointed to the Superior Court in D.C. by George H.W. Bush and later to the federal court by Bill Clinton. He's the one honest Clinton or Obama judge in that courthouse. The rest of them, in my view, are a bunch of political hacks. And, but he's a good man, Sullivan. And uh, give credit where credit is due. I think he's going to force in camera review of these documents or something to that effect. What does that mean, camera review? It means that he's going to look at them inside his chambers to see whether they're really exempt or not from production. And Got it. Remember this judge. He didn't go as far as he should have gone, but in the FOIA request of Uma Abedin, which Judicial Watch had filed, my former group, which we then joined in. He later allowed for questions to be asked in writing. I urged him to allow oral questions because then he can follow up with Hillary Clinton. And that's quite remarkable for a judge who was appointed to the bench by Bill Clinton. Right. Right. Okay. So the other thing that we've got in this release, Larry, is your office, Freedom Watch, which people can support at freedomwatchusa.org or by, or by going to patreon.com slash Freedom Watch, you guys have filed this uh, response, and this was filed just four days ago with the court. What can you tell us about this response and what it is going to provoke, hopefully? Judge Sullivan did respond to it within two days. He said he's willing to hear more about this so-called glitch by September 28th, which isn't too long from now, and he asked our so-called government for an explanation as to why he wasn't told sooner about the computer glitch. So he's already looking sideways at them right now, and we hope to amplify that uh, frame of mind with the judge. Because if anybody has been deceived and defrauded, it's the court. And wow. these judges will take offense, if they're honest, like Judge Sullivan, that they've been played with. The other judge that I like over there is Royce Lambert, and he'll use the word trifle, don't trifle with my court. Right. And the flout, the flout court process, that's his favorite word. I've been in front of Lambert many times over the years. And, you know, this is an affront not just to Freedom Watch, the American people, but it's an affront to Judge Sullivan that they play with him this way. Yeah. And uh, I think he's going to put a split down. He was the judge, by the way, uh, when I was running Judicial Watch in the late 90s, who ordered Vice President Dick Cheney to come clean on his energy task force, uh, which was holding behind the scenes closed door meetings with lobbyists hmm. over energy policy. Wow. And, you know, we found out this went all the way to the Supreme Court, this case. Right. And we found out that Cheney and, and the boys were dividing up the oil fields in Iraq before we invaded. That was one wow. of the great motives of George W. Bush and uh, Uncle Dick to invade. That's unbelievable. Interest, and then they didn't even get it. I mean, <laughs> how stupid! How stupid! <laughs> it's not a laughing matter, but you're right. It's outrageous, Larry. 
Now, the other thing that I've included in this release is uh, some of the emails between Joseph Dugan and yourself. I personally redacted the email addresses because I didn't think you wanted a million people emailing you necessarily. Of course, they can go to freedomwatchusa.org if they want to contact you or join the citizens' grand juries or anything like that. But in this email, it's very interesting to see the language Mr. Dugan has uh, selected. And this was written to you only five days before the release was supposed to occur. And of course, some of those days were Saturday and Sunday. So he's just saying, uh, unfortunately, as you may be aware, DOJ's Office of Information Policy recently learned of a technical glitch that occurred during an email server migration earlier this year. The glitch prevented some emails for some DOJ records custodians from being transferred to DOJ's current records repository. So, Larry, if this is true, what he's saying, that in the course of their normal technical operations, they've deleted vast quantities of uh, information that's the property of the people of the United States, that's a very serious mishandling of information, isn't it? Well, it is, and, and they're usually, there's backup. You never really get rid of deletions. They can be found. In fact, in the first email scandal with Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton back in the early 2000s, when I was at Judicial Watch, Judge Lambert ordered at the expense of $8 million wow. computer experts to recreate the emails to bring them back. Plus, Ooh. we know the National Security Agency has all of these emails, so they can be obtained. Now, will that happen from the NSA? No, the judges protect the NSA, and the Justice Department obviously doesn't push on that. But what Dugan was doing, he was breaking the bad news, and you're right, uh, Jason, that, you know, this looks more than suspicious. That's your implication. Uh, gee, they're gone, and they may have been deleted. Well, you can guarantee that they've been deleted. Okay, this is the way they break the bad news. 